So what happened, so says one young woman, university student got up and she said to her, Dr. Sachin said, do you realize your audience is Muslims? We believe in God, we believe in Holy Quran, we believe in Prophet. This is in our blood, in our cells. So you are hurting our feelings and we are not willing to listen to you. So you can go home and you know, whatever. So with me, we get engaged into dialogue. So I can take that position, you know, and then the, the dialogue is shut and they go home and they never talk to me. So depending, what, if you want to just say the truth, you can say the truth. But my feeling is that engaging them in a dialogue, that you're saying, in, you know, and then gradually, you see, they invite me to their home, I meet with them, they come there, and they know, I, they know I'm not hiding, I'm not pretending to be a Muslim. I'm a secular humanist, I'm willing to listen, willing to have a dialogue. So I feel in the 10 years, the people who are on the right, who are believers in the family of the heart, will see the same woman that who spoke, you will believe. We had a discussion 10 years ago, can we say goodbye to God? I was on the atheist side. This woman who came as an agnostic and atheist last week was on the other side. She was a believer. So there is a shift. Although she's still angry, meaning she's an angry atheist, but the gradually she has moved this way. And So I think to me, you have the right to say that. I'm not saying that you shouldn't say that. But then you need to know whatever you're saying, then how far you want to go with that. I feel, and that's why I like Chris, that as a personality, he's gentle, he's soft, and he's not that positive. And I feel that it's not only winning the argument, in my mind, I want to win the argument, but also win the heart. That's my sort of philosophy. Mm -hmm. And gradually, it works more, more and more people. It, in my experience of 10 years, that you would not believe that so many people who are very strong believers gradually talk to me, want to invite me, have a discussion, have a dialogue, because I say, I don't agree with you, but I respect your point of view. I don't agree with it. So respecting does not mean that I agree with you, I condone it. That is your point of view, I want to understand. So I think engaging in a dialogue, the same thing in therapy, at the end, there's far more likelihood of learning from each other than stating the fact, stating the truth, and then ending, it sort of ends. That's my view. So my experience has shown me or maybe it's part of my personality or as a therapist to engage in the dialogue and keep the dialogue going and you will be surprised. There are times you, you have to end, end the conversation and, and you just kind of walk your separate ways. Um, up until that point, um, there are various examples that you can, you can try to use that, that I do mention in the book. And one of the things I talk about on, on this lecture tour is what's called the spectrum of diplomacy. It's kind of how much do you go for the jugular on somebody who disagrees with you and how much do you just kind of back off and let them stumble through it and, and maybe see things a little bit differently. And so I then see myself in the role of facilitator as I imagine you do in your therapies. You get people to work through their problems and you, you get them to think in a particular way that they've not been thinking in before. This is called cognitive behavioral therapy, right? So when you come to a point where they're just suffering from QS and they just can't pull, pull, seem to pull it out, um, the best thing, I suppose, is to, to provide as many examples as you can of inconsistencies and, and, and contradictions which have gone uh, unanswered or basically unreconciled, irreconciled within their, their arguments and to let them know that they are believing in something which is defying certain principles of, of how we think about the world. And again, on the spectrum of diplomacy, you have to determine how far you wish to push them in that regard. Some people, you push them to a certain level and they will just dig in their heels and that's when the, that's when the game is over, it's, you know, the conversation's done. And because I believe you're upsetting what I call their mimetic equilibrium. They're, they're in their happy place, having answered the big five in a supernatural way. And now you come along and you start asking questions, which is upsetting the apple cart a bit. And they don't, they don't want to be in that spot. Because supernatural answers to the big five produces an incredible high. It, it springs opioid receptors uh, that, that stops pain. Uh, it's, it's clearly uh, dopaminergic. Serotonin is involved. A number of neurotransmitters are flowing through a person's brain when they are feeling a, a particular way about the world. And now a guy like you comes along and asks them difficult questions. 
And you've got to figure out at what point is their mimetic equilibrium going to go to the point where instead of just instilling a little bit of doubt and a little bit of clarity into their worldview, you've now gone too far. And they're going to they're gonna dig in. And they might hate you for it because they don't like having their most heartfelt beliefs challenged. They, they want to return to their happy place. So they will block you out and make you unreal somehow. And often I get the, the case where you know, there's that kind of permanent smile, I'll pray for you, and I, I hope the Lord enters into your heart someday in this almost uh, cult-like manner.